Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to speak about the operative list prioritization station, which you may face in your exam. And it's very, very important station. You have to know how to approach, how to prioritize the cases and what the, the things you need to speak about and discuss with the examiners. There are some tricks um, like, you know, you have to be aware of because they are very important for the patient safety. So I'm going to give you some tricks today so you can approach for any operative list and prioritize your cases correctly. First of all, you need to read the whole list just to be aware of all the cases you have and then check which cases are uh, like they, 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 they will need uh, an inpatient admission after the procedure and which cases are the day case. We should start with the day case procedures. Why? Usually, we are working in the normal working hours here from 9 to 5. Okay? So any patients who cross who crosses 5 p.m., she will be admitted overnight for observation. Even if she is a day case procedure, it should, it, she should stay overnight. So, for example, if you delay the day case procedure to the end of the list, is probably she will cross the time and she will be admitted unnecessarily overnight. But if you start with the day case procedure in the beginning of your list, then she will have only two hours of recovery and then she can go home once she's okay. So it's better to start with like hysteroscopy, ERPC, um, like laparoscopic sterilization, the patients who are expected not to have any complication and will not need possibly any admission. So you should start with these cases first. The cases which may take longer time, like total laparoscopic hysterectomy, total abdominal hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy and pelvic floor repair should be the, like, you know, not, not to start with. That's because if any complications happens, happened during your procedure and you, you may need to call the urology, you may need to call the bowel surgeon, you may need to call anyone, uh, that, that will take longer time and you may already, um, you may have to cancel the other cases of your list. So you start with the short taking times um, cases and uh, end with the longer cases because the longer cases anyway are going to stay in the hospital so if they cross the out of hours that's fine they are going to stay anyway and you already done the short time cases okay so check which cases you will need uh, they will need inpatient and start with the day case surgery and then uh, start with the diabetic patients this is very important if you have a diabetic case in your list uh, we can't keep them fasting very long time. Um, so if you have a case, a diabetic case, and uh, she should take the priority, okay? However, if you expect that the diabetic case is going to take longer time than others, then you can feed her now and put her to the end of the list and start with the others, okay? So. If you think that you, you need to start with anyone else rather than the diabetic patient, you should feed the diabetic patient now and put her to the end of the list. Okay? Um, the most important patient safety issue for, for the operative list prioritization is to ensure that you have a negative pregnancy test done for all the cases in childbearing period. So for everyone, you should do a, a urine pregnancy test and a VTE risk assessment. VTE risk assessment should be done for everyone. And we have to stress on, it, on two important points in the VTE risk assessment. First of all, whether this patient's taking any anticoagulant treatment before the surgery or no. So if she's taking any heparin, um, before the surgery, we need to be sure that she stopped the therapeutic dose of her heparin or clixane around uh, at least 24 hours before the procedures because uh, she may 
have regional anesthesia, which is contraindicated within the first 24 hours of stopping the dose. And uh, having a clexan recently, uh, that can increase the risk of bleeding. So if, for example, you have a hysterectomy is to be done today under regional anesthesia, and the patient had her clexan like few hours ago, we should postpone her surgery till completing 24 hours from her clexan. Okay. Um, the other point of the VTE risk assessment, which we need to stress on, whether the patient is was on any hormonal treatment before the procedure or no. Like if she's taking a hormonal contraception, especially the combined ones, or if she's if she was on HRT, she should have stopped them at least four weeks before her procedure. Okay, so. What if she doesn't know about that or no one told her to stop her HRT or contraception or she forgot to do that, then we need to cancel her case today and postpone it until she completed four weeks before her surgery without any hormones. Okay, so these are the most important two points in the VTE risk assessment for all cases, okay? Then, for all the cases, you need to take a rapid history, do a quick examination, and review the investigations done before. Like, for example, a patient who had um, a scan on the pelvis and she's coming to remove a cyst, to, so you have to review this, the scan report just to know uh, more about the size and the site uh, and the nature of the cyst, like, you know, uh, if, if she has um, investigations done, like, for example, uh, any biopsy before, uh, like endometrial biopsy or anything, then you need to have a look on the histology. And uh, any routine investigations done prior to your procedure, you have to be aware of her hemoglobin and to be sure that she's optimized to have the surgery today. Okay? So that's uh, the first thing when you have the first look on your uh, list. Uh, um, while you are taking the history from your patient, you should stress on certain points. You know, you will take the history as usual on these points specifically before our surgery. So we need to check if she's on any regular medication because it can interfere with the treatment, can interfere with the anesthesia. Uh, and also if we need to uh, continue any of them, like if she's on any antihypertensive uh, or any blood sugar regulation medication or L-thyroxine or anything, like, you know, we need to con continue taking them. Uh, that's it. Uh, or she may be asthmatic on inhaler, so we need to, to be aware of that. Um, we need to check also the allergic status because we are in in some cases we are going to give antibiotic prophylaxis so if she's allergic to penicillin for example we need to consider any alternatives uh, and to be aware of her allergies um, the concerns regarding blood transfusion because we have um, the risk of bleeding in all of our procedures so we need to be sure that uh, just in case she needs a blood transfusion while she's under anesthesia. Is she happy to have it or no? Okay. And the very important thing is the previous metal work. What is the meaning of that? If a lady has, for example, hip replacement and she has a metal work, this is very important to know before your surgery because if you are going to do to to use a, the diathermy or cutary, you have to be aware that if she has a metal work inserted then you can't use the monopolar because the monopolar, the, the patient is part of your circuit. So the, the electricity will pass through the patient body. And if there is a metal work, there is a very, very high risk of burn and electricity can be transmitted to that device. So it's very important if you have a patient in your list which has any previous metal work, to be aware about the diathermy safety issues, okay? And um, the need to involve other specialty in your patient care, that means if the patient is, for example, cardiac, 
uh, if the patient is having uh, any issues related to the coagulation problems. So you may need to involve the cardiologist to have an echo, ECG, if she's cardiac. You may need to involve the hematologist for the bridging thromboprophylaxis if needed, if she's taking any uh, chronic anticoagulant treatment. We need to know and to ask the hematologist um, about her bridging process. Okay, so and any other speciality uh, that is like you know, a communication with colleague procedure, like you know, if any injury happens, we will call the uh, like you know, if bladder injury happens, we will call the urology, uh, if bowel injury happens, we will call the bowel surgeon, if any vascular injury happens, we will call the vascular surgeon. So it's involving the other speciality in your care as well. Uh, and by the end of uh, doing all of that, you need to take the patient's consents for the procedure. So usually we take the patient consent on the same day of the surgery um, or confirming the consent if it is already taken in the clinic. But in most of the cases, we take the consent on the same day of the surgery. So you, you will go take the history, examine the patient, look at the in investigations done, confirm that the indication is still present, and then take the patient consent. While you are taking the patient consent, you have to ensure that the patient has been offered alternative treatment for the procedure. For example, if she's coming today for a pelvic floor repair for cyst to seal or rect to seal, for example, just be sure that she's aware that there is a pessary and she declined or she doesn't want or she tried before. If a patient came for uh, laparoscopic sterilization, for example, be sure that she has been offered other alternatives like long acting contraception and she's aware of that. Um, and she's happy to proceed, okay? So that's, that's very important. So let's have some examples um, of the cases that you may have during um, your operative list. So the first case you may face is hysterectomy for benign causes, okay? So hysterectomy can be done either for benign or malignant causes. So it's a bit different if you have a cancer patient or a benign patient. So first of all, we need to be sure what is the indication of hair hysterectomy. Is it a heavy menstrual bleeding? Is it adenomyosis, endometriosis, PMS, prolapse, or precancerous lesion? Why? Because if, for example, she is coming to remove hair womb for endometriosis, we may expect lots of adhesions inside, okay? Uh, if she's going to uh, to do it for heavy menstrual bleeding, we may need to confirm that she has tried everything like before, like including the medication uh, to stop the bleeding, including the, hormo the hormonal treatment. She did any uh, endometrial ablation uh, or, or no. Uh, there are some um, indications like precancerous lesions, like, you know, any cervical problems or any endometrial hyperplasia. We need to be sure about her uh, fer fertility wishes. If she's already aware that once we remove the, the womb, she will not be able to get pregnant. And also if um, if she's like uh, removing it for premenstrual syndrome, she should be aware that she will need uh, hormone replacement therapy because she's uh, usually will be in the childbearing period. Okay, so the indication will differ in the counseling about the procedure and what we need. Okay, um, it's very important to know the patient age. That's because we have to decide regarding keeping or removing the ovary. It's very, very important. So how we can decide we are going to keep or remove the ovaries. So if she's in a childbearing period, that there are uh, the choice will be given to the patient, but if she is post menopausal, there is no point to, to keep the ovaries, they are not working anymore. So, if she is post menopausal, anyway, we are going to take everything out. But if she's in the childbearing period, we need to be sure that she is not high risk to develop any cancer, like while we are taking the family history, the previous history, and everything. 
she is low risk for developing uh, cancer breast or cancer ovaries, then we may give her the choice either to keep the ovaries, but she should be aware that if she developed any other pathology in her ovaries, it's very difficult to be diagnosed and also the, the operation will be very tricky, okay? But if she wants to remove her ovaries, that will deprive her from having her hormones. And in that case, she will need to, to use the HRT till the normal age of menopause, which is around 52. So we'll explain the risks and the benefits and then give the choice to the patient. And according to the wishes, we will go ahead. But if she's high risk to have cancer or if she's postmenopausal, we are going anyway to remove the ovaries, okay? We need to be sure of her BMI. So if the patient is having BMI uh, of a high or large number, then we may consider like, you know, uh, this patient may be having difficult um, anesthesia. She will have difficult anesthesia, both regional and general. She will have possibly difficult procedures. You, we may need um, like retractors, extra retractors. We may need extra help, extra people, um, specific uh, requirements in handling the patients and uh, you know the bed itself. Uh, also, risk of VTE will be higher in case of high BMI and the risk of infection okay infection like wound infection so the v bmi can uh, affect many things in our procedure so it's very 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 important if you are taking a history from an operative uh, a pre-operative patient uh, to stress on her bmi um you need to be aware of her previous surgeries okay if she is having previous surgeries that means we expect lots of adhesions inside, okay? And the presence of adhesions will put another risk of difficult surgery and risk of injury to the surrounding organs, including ureters, bladder, and bowel, okay? So we need to be aware of that, and we need to counsel the patient about that. Like, if she's having multiple surgeries before then the operation is going to be tricky the risk of injuries will be higher okay and the most important point here in any hysterectomy is to choose which approach we are going to do we have three approaches for the hysterectomy either we will do tlh which is total laparoscopic hysterectomy or total abdominal hysterectomy or vaginal hysterectomy. So how can we decide whether we are going to do total laparoscopic hysterectomy or like suppose for example we decided we are going through the abdominal route because the vaginal route has only one indication which is vaginal prolapse. Okay, there are uh, there is new approach uh, like is, is, is happening here, uh, which is vaginal laparoscopic, but it is not, not widespread yet. So we will keep the vaginal indication for the vaginal uh, prolapse, the, the uterine prolapse, okay? However, if we decided that our approach is going to be abdominal, so is, is it going to be open or laparoscopic? So that depends on the indication and the size of the womb. So if the patient, for example, has multiple fibroid uterus and very bulky uterus, it's unlikely that we will manage to remove it laparoscopically. Okay, so in that case, we are going to open. Um, if the patient uh, is having, you know, um, a normal size uterus or like the benign indication, which doesn't affect the size of the uterus, 
then we can approach laparoscopically okay if we have multiple multiple surgeries before and we expect lots of adhesions and there is endometriosis and and so and so we may counsel the patient that we are going to try laparoscopically but the risk to turn it to open surgery is very high okay so like that we have to uh, handle each case separately um, after choosing the approach which is either laparoscopic or total abdominal hysterectomy if we choose that we are going to do abdominal hysterectomy like open surgery then we need to decide which type of incision we are going to do because if you expect a difficult a very difficult procedure then you need a midline incision because you will have a proper exploration and easier procedure if you open a midline but if it is okay like you know if you don't expect that much difficulty you can do finished steel incision or low transverse incision whatever you are comfortable with um, it's more cosmetic and uh, the healing and the risk of infection is less okay but if you need to do midline incision you have to do that in, that's in case of the uterus is very bulky and you expect lots of adhesions inside and so on okay and please you have to counsel the patient before going ahead that the incision may be midline because she may expect another uh, low transverse or finished steel incision and then she found herself after the procedure that she's having a midline and she will not be happy so she should be counseled for that before and as i told you uh, the allergic status is very important so we are going to give antibiotic prophylaxis for all hysterectomy cases Usually, the protocol is for coamoxiclav IV, and if she's allergic to penicillin, we can give gentamicin and metronidazole IV. Okay, check with the anesthetist if he's happy to proceed. It's very, very important. This is, this is one, one of the communication with colleagues' technique. So, uh, if we are expecting difficult intubation, or if she's having very high BMI and we expect a difficult approach of anesthesia, or if the patient is suffering from any chronic illness which is not optimized, the anesthetist will not be happy to proceed. Uh, if the patient is having any um, problems that may interfere with her, with her breathing, like, for example, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, okay? So in that case, general anesthesia will not suit her and we should advise her to to be in regional anesthesia. And also, if she's having any, um, like, you know, anything which may compress her lung or affect her breathing, uh, the, the laparoscopic approach is not preferable because we put the patient head down and we fill the abdomen with gas that will put a very huge load on the lungs as well and compress her lungs more and that will interfere with her breathing and saturation. So in that case, if we have the choice, we should proceed for abdominal hysterectomy rather than doing a total laparoscopic one. Okay, so it's very important to check whether she's having any problems that may interfere with her anesthesia, then we will advise her to have a regional one and um, if if she's expected to have any uh, like you know complication related to any chronic illness uh, like if she's uh, renal if she's having renal problem chronic renal problem chronic cardiac issue chronic lung disease anything like that she should be optimized before the surgery okay so the hysterectomy usually you will find hysterectomy in every operative list so it's very, very, very important. You have to be aware of all of what we talk so that you can um, speak about everything, okay? Um, another case which may be hysterectomy for cancer, like a patient who has uh, already done endometrial biopsy, for example, and uh, it came back with definite cancer diagnosis, or a patient who had ovarian cancer diagnosed and confirmed 
and the patient had already the MDT decision to do total abdominal hysterectomy as a treatment. So we will do the same as what we did with the previous one with benign, for benign causes. Plus, here it's mandatory to take the, the ovaries, both of the ovaries. There is no choice here to keep the ovaries. Either it is a cervical cancer, uh, endometrial cancer, or ovarian cancers, we can't keep any of the ovaries, okay? That's very important. The, same, the, the other thing, we need to review the MDT decision, okay? And um, we may consider pretoneal wash and omental biopsy in our uh, procedure. If it is not mentioned in the list, we need to be sure that we need to discuss with the examiner that we need to review the MDT report to see whether we need um, peritoneal wash or mental biopsy to be done during the procedure or no, because that will be included in the MDT decision, okay? Don't forget, all of the cancer patients should have prophylactic low molecular weight heparin for four weeks post operative This is very, very important, and this is a patient safety issue. And we need to counsel the patient while we are taking the consent that she may need further treatment depending on the histology. So this is not the final treatment. So we will send the histology and we will check whether she needs any further treatments. Further treatments can be chemotherapy, can be radiotherapy. It depends on what kind of cancer she has. And also it can be another surgery like staging laparotomy or any other surgery, okay? So we should inform the patient about this point. It's very, very important that you may need uh, further treatment after the histology report. And the most important thing here, as I told you earlier, that cancer cases cannot be delayed. Like, you know, we have to give priority to them because the cancer, the cancer busway here uh, states that we need to start the treatment from within 62 days with the, from the referral, the first referral from the GP or from the first diagnosis or suspicion uh, that there is a cancer. We should start our treatment within 62 days. So, for example, there, they, uh, once the patient is referred as a cancer busway, like the two weeks cancer pathway, there will be something called the target date of treatment, and they will uh, count 62 days. For example, they count the 62 days, and they came the 1st of July is her target date. So they, everywhere in her notes, they, you will see the target date is the 1st of July, target date of the 1st of July. And for example, her uh, surgery to, is today, and uh, we are in June, for example, and then still two weeks for her target date. So I can't delay her case today unless I got another appointment for her within the, the coming two weeks to ensure that we, we, we are not breaking her target date, okay? So please give priority for the cancer case upon the hysterectomy for benign cases, okay? For benign causes. So if you have to delay one of them, you should delay the benign one and to give priority for that, okay? The other case you may face in your list is uh, the ovarian cyst, especially the dermoid, and uh, usually they will bring for you a large dermoid cyst. So what are the concerns uh, while we are uh, reviewing a patient with dermoid cyst? And what are the uh, possibilities of her procedure technique and approach? So while we are taking the history, we should uh, ensure the patient age. Usually, dermoid cysts are common in the childbearing period and young ages. Um, you should check the investigations done for the cyst before. And uh, to know the size of the cyst, don't forget to examine the patient abdominally before going uh, ahead and tell the patient that we are going to examine you again under anesthesia, just to be sure, um, and decide which which point we are going to start with, okay? Uh, 
the BMI is very important. If the patient is having high BMI, um, there may be a difficulty in approaching laparoscopic procedure. And if we are even approaching um, laparotomy, then the risk of infection will be high as well. So we need to be aware if she's high BMI. Also, a history of previous surgeries um, is very important, as we mentioned before. So we expect uh, lots of adhesions. And also, the dermoid cyst, you, you know that it can be uh, very large and can be amalgated with other organs. So adhesions are expected here as well. So the risk of injuries to the other surrounding organs is very high, especially here, like ovarian cyst ovary is very near to the ureter in the ovarian fossa. So if we are going to deal with ovarian cyst with adhesions, so there is a risk that we may injure the ureter. So we need to tell the patient about it. Uh, the approach. So actually, it depends on the size of the cyst. Some dermoid cysts are small, uh, so we can proceed normally uh, through laparoscopic procedure. But sometimes the cyst may be very big to the extent that it can reach the umbilicus. So if the cyst already reaching the umbilicus and you are going to do a laparoscopy with various needles, there is a risk that you may puncture or you may go through the cyst. So it's unsafe to do that. So if you are like, you know, if you prefer to go with laparoscopy, it's better to go for Palmer's point if you think the cyst is big. and then insert the uh, umbilical port under vision so that you will be sure that you will not go through the cyst. So it's very important to counsel the patient if she has a large dermoid cyst or a large ovarian cyst before going ahead that sometimes you may not be able to go through your belly button unless we go through another point here is called palmar points and then to do it safely. And also here the risk of turning to laparotomy is higher than any other case of laparoscopy. So we should counsel the patient that if we need or if we struggle to take your cyst out, then we are going to do laparotomy because the cyst is big. So to take it out through the port is very difficult. Some doctors may do uh, like, you know, they may drain it inside an endo bag and take it out. And that depends on how much solid amount and uh, liquid because you know if the pay, if the cyst contains uh, cyst like you know solid and, and and liquid both of them so we can aspirate the fluid part and then the solid part can't be aspirated so if the cyst is containing more solid than cyst than fluid then the aspiration will not help and the cyst will be very big to be come out through the port side so we can counsel the patient that sometimes you may need to extend the incision to take the cyst out. So you may have many laparotomy to take the cyst. You may, we may convert the whole procedure to laparotomy if we struggle to dissect the cyst. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need also to confirm her fertility wishes and concerns. So if, for example, she has large dermoid cyst on the left ovary, we should be sure that the right ovary is healthy and the right uh, ovarian tube is healthy because usually in most of the cases of dermoid cyst, um, it will be amalgated and uh, involving the ovarian tissues and the tube on the same side. So we need to counsel the patient that is a, there is a possibility that we may need to take the ovary and the tube on the same side. So we need to be sure that the other side is normal. We will ensure her that uh, since she has one ovary and tube, then there is no effect on her future fertility. She can get pregnant, she can get pregnant as normal and this will not uh, affect her fertility at all. But if she has like, for example, previous history of PID or ectopic pregnancy or another ovarian cyst on the other side or anything done to the other side, then 
the fertility which is here will matter. And then we need to counsel the patient that uh, we don't have a choice if we found the ovary, um, if we cannot separate the ovary from the cyst and we need to consent to have for that. Um, and don't forget the other risks of laparoscopy. So usual risks of laparoscopy for any procedure, like, you know, the pain, bleeding, infection, injury to bowel, injury to bladder, um, the um, injury to uh, ureter, injury to blood vessel. Don't forget the injury to blood vessel. Some, some patients may got injury to a, a large blood vessel, okay? Um, uh, it's a very serious con condition, but you know she has to be aware. Of. And also um, the possibility of converting it to open um, risk of like you know inability to complete the procedure, whatever. So the other risks of laparoscopy should be mentioned to the patient. But uh, I mentioned specifically these other uh, factors which are specific to each case but you have to add to them the other um, uh, possible risks as normal discussion, okay? Um, this is a laparoscopic sterilization. It can be one of the cases you may face also in your exam. So we need to be sure uh, of the patient age. Suppose, for example, the patient is like <laughs> 23 years old and she came asking for tubal sterilization. Um, usually is, is not like, you know, uh, something which is usual. Um, but if, for example, she is like 35, 40, yeah, she can have that uh, after counseling. But if she's very, very young, um, we need to be sure that she's sure of her decision and that decision has been discussed with at least two consultants and then we can proceed. Um, parity. Yeah, parity can also have an effect of our decision, is either to proceed or no, because if she's having only one child, she may regret her decision later on. Uh, or if she if she doesn't have, like, you know, any uh, children also, that's very odd. So we need to confirm the parity as well. We need to ensure that she's very sure of her decision because it's, like irreversible process, and still we have a failure rate of one in 200. She should be aware of that, and she should be aware that she can get pregnant. There is no uh, method which is 100% effective. Um, she should be aware of all alternatives. We need to, again, discuss with her the long-acting contraceptive uh, alternatives. Uh, including vasectomy, including uh, subdermal implant, including uh, marina coil, everything we should again repeat on her and then if she's sure uh, that she doesn't want to try any of these, then we can proceed. Then we are going to have a laparoscopic surgery or a laparoscopic procedure, so we need to know about her previous surgeries because the risk of uh, possible difficult surgery and risk of injury will be higher in that case. For example, he will give you a case with previous three cesarean sections and so on and so. So it's very important to counsel her regarding the risk of adhesions and the risk of injuries. Um, and she's aware that it is an irreversible procedure. There is no reversal in NHS. And if she wants that, it will not be funded. She should go for private, and sometimes it, it will not be possible. Um, and the other risks of laparoscopy, as we mentioned, like injuries, uh, pain, bleeding, infection, injuries to the surrounding, converting to open surgery if necessary, and so on. Okay. Let's see another case, which is hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy can be um, for post bleeding when we need to take an endometrial biopsy um, for removal of polyp or removal of coil or, for example, or prior to endometrial ablation or just diagnostic one. So there are many indications of hysteroscopy. So we need to be sure about the indication first. Uh, she should be aware about the possible risks, including the uterine perforation. And if uterine perforation happens 
then the risk of bladder injury or bowel injury can happen. So in that case, we may need to do laparoscopy. So she should be aware of doing a key keyhole procedure if necessary. So she should be consented for that before going ahead. And uh, also, we need to counsel her that if it is like just diagnostic one, we need to tell her that sometimes we may go with the scope and uh, with the camera and we may not find any pathology. So she will be exposed to anesthesia and possible surgical risks without any uh, any uh, thing. Um, in case of endometrial ablation, if the case is coming for endometrial ablation, we have to add uh, possible uh, risks to the procedure. Like uh, sometimes you may no, not be able to do the procedure while she's under anesthesia. That's because the uh, system which is doing the uh, endometrial ablation has to measure the cavity of the uterus and the length and everything and do some checks before starting the ablation. Sometimes the system will not start if, they, if, if, if these measurements didn't meet the criteria set it, okay? So that's very important to tell the patient that sometimes you may not be able to do the procedure. And if we are able to do it, if we manage to do the procedure, there is a risk of failure of one in four women, like three women will get benefit and one of them will continue to have the bleeding, so the next step will be hysterectomy. And the most important part is this is not a contraception method. You still can be pregnant, can get pregnant after the procedure, so that you need a proper contraception after the endometrial ablation. That's because if you get pregnant on top of endometrial ablation, your pregnancy will be considered a very, very high risk because the placenta here will not be adherent to the normal endometrium because the endometrium is not there anymore. So it will stuck to the underlying basal layer and will invade deeply in the layers of the muscles of the uterus. So it will be accreta from the beginning and the blood flow through this placenta will not be enough to your baby. So it will be a very high risk pregnancy. So uh, that's everything we need to add in case of endometrial ablation case. Other cases will be as usual, like normal risks, but don't forget about the uterine perforation and the risk of laparoscopy if, if required. And we have also evacuation of products of conception, which is ERPC, can be for either miscarriage or molar pregnancy or termination of pregnancy. Uh, the most important thing here is the blood group and concern about blood transfusion. Blood group so that we can be aware that she may need anti-D or no. That's very, very important in patient safety. Uh, concerns about blood transfusion because she may have bleeding and she may need blood transfusion. So we need to be aware whether she's Jehovah's Witness or no. Um, we need to be sure that she signed all the consent forms, including what we call sensitive tissue disposal form. Uh, that's a specific form in the NHS which allows the hospital or the patient to dispose the products of conception safely uh, and sensitively. We cannot approach ERPC without this form. So we need to be sure that she signed already the sensitive tissue disposal form and she signed her consent. We need to be sure that uh, she requires any follow-up or no. Like the most common patients who requires follow-up is molar pregnancy. And the other one is the one who have a recurrent miscarriage. So if any of these cases, we need to uh, set a follow-up appointment in the clinic to have her follow-up visits, okay? And uh, we need to counsel her that sometimes you may face difficulty in cervical dilatation. Sometimes we may not have complete evacuation of all the pregnancy remains. So there, there may be a possibility of incomplete evacuation. And also the risk of injuries as any procedure, including the perforation, uterine perforation. And if that happened, we may need to proceed with a keyhole surgery as well. Okay, procedure should be 
safely done under ultra ultrasound guidance that's for patient safety safety and uh, to ensure also that we evacuated everything and the, uh, the uterus is empty okay it's a very uh, simple technique and uh, while you have a patient like that in your list you should start with because it will not take time and it is a day case procedure and she will go home straight away so uh, usually they will put for you um like two short cases like one lapars one hysteroscopy or one uh ARPC, you should start with those cases they then the laparoscopic procedure then the total abdominal or tlh okay uh the last one we may face is pelvic floor repair so sometimes you may face a case like that in in your list um the main indication usually will be vaginal wall prolapse sometimes it may be associated with vaginal like vaginal hysterectomy so it will be vaginal hysterectomy plus or minus pelvic floor repair so she so the patient may have a uterine prolapse plus uh, cyst to rectocele as well so the age of the patient is very important bmi and also um, we need to be sure that she has been offered the alternatives including physiotherapy Pissary and all of that has been tried before and didn't work or she declined and she want to proceed for surgical uh, procedure. Um, she has to be aware of the risk of bowel injury and bladder injury. We are working very near to the bladder and the bowel. So she should be aware of that. Also, we need to be sure that whether she's sexually active or not, because there is a risk of dyspareunia after the procedure. The, the vagina will be getting tight. And also, if we uh, proceed with a sacrospinous fixation, that will add more to her uh, pain during intercourse. Um, she should be aware of the risk of recurrence. And uh, if she, come, she comes with recurrent prolapse, um, having another procedure on the recurrent prolapse will be very tricky because of the fibrosis inside the tissue. And that means that um, the risk factors of the prolapse are still there, so the surgery will not help again. So she should be aware of the risk of recurrence. So if she has any risk factors like chronic cough or B high BMI or anything like, like that can precipitate recurrence, she should correct it uh, as soon as possible. Also, uh, we need to counsel the patient that she may expect a vaginal pack and catheter for at least 24 to 48 hours post-operatively. And um, if we are uh, happy with everything, then she will be um, allowed to take the uh, catheter and back out, and then she can go home if she passes urine as normal. Okay, so these are most of the cases you may face in your operative list. I know it's a very long video, but it's very, very important because um, the list can contain four or five cases. You have to uh, put in your mind everything you need to discuss and you need to prioritize the cases. As I told you, you start with the short time taking cases. And uh, if you have a diabetic patient, give the priority. If you have a cancer patient, give the priority. Don't forget pregnancy test for everyone and VTA risk assessment. Okay? Good luck. Thank you.